Well, good evening, YA. I'm excited to be with you guys here today. So I just want to welcome you guys here. I also want to welcome the online community, those of you watching online, welcome. And uh, I thank you, Jakeem, for introducing me, but I wanted to introduce myself too, just to those of you who don't know me. Now, like Jakeem said, I am over our fifth and sixth grade ministry that we call 56, and there's actually quite a few of you YA in the YA community that serve in 56, so we love having you guys. Um, but I also, also wanted to speak to this, okay, because I don't want you guys looking around like, why is he hobbling around? He looks like he's physically fit, right? Why are you guys laughing? That's not nice, right? Why is he hobbling around? Well, I'll get to that in just one second. But first again, my name's Jesus. I have a beautiful wife named Myra who is here today. Yay, Myra. Uh, two amazing boys, Jeremiah, who is five years old, who we run around on chase all the time. Isaiah, who is two years old, same thing. He loves to run around. He loves to scream. He's got some really healthy lungs. And I guess now these days I'm more hobbling around after him, but this works out good sometimes. Like, get back here, buddy. Let me pull you over here. Just kidding. But here's what happened, okay? There was a bus that was out of control, and I'm just kidding. I wish. I wish that was the story. I wish that was the story. But in reality, here's, you guys ever, you're doing something that's like a normal activity in your everyday life, and you don't know, like, what the heck just happened? How did I hurt myself doing this? You guys ever have that happen? Some of you are shaking your head. I'm very happy. Thank you for saying that because it's really embarrassing. I had an ice chest before our midweek service, and it was a big ice chest. Okay, It wasn't like a small one. It was a big one, right? And I loaded it with a bunch of drinks for our kids, the most heaviest ice you've ever seen in your life, right? And I picked that thing up, and I'm walking sideways out the door with it, and my knee just popped, and I fell to the floor, I'm like, what the heck is going on? I needed help to get up. That's how bad it was. And you know, my wife right away was like, well, you need to take you to the doctor. I'm like, yeah, it'll be fine. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll sleep it off. It'll be good in the morning. Wake up, and it's bruised, and it's swollen. Went to the doctor. And long story short, I tore my meniscus pulling an ice chest. So now you know why I was trying to make something up, right? Because that sounds pretty pathetic, okay? And now I have to have an MRI. I might need to have surgery. It's crazy that something so simple that is a part of my everyday life, right? I mean, I'm not always pulling an ice chest, but it's a pretty simple thing, right? But how true is it in our lives that there are things that happen when we're going about our normal day, we're not looking for adversity to hit us, we're not looking for difficult times, we're not looking for hardships, but they seem to find their way to us. Isn't that right? And in those moments, when that happens, when our world can get turned upside down in just a split second, sometimes it's like, what the heck? Why? Why is this happening right now? I was doing so good. Sometimes we can turn it and then look to God and be like, God, I, I, was, I was following you. I was being obedient to what you've asked me to do. Why is this happening in my life right now? Then there's other times where we as believers, we end up putting ourselves in situations and in places that maybe we shouldn't. And then adversity hits us there, and we're like, God, why? And God's like, I didn't want you to do that in the first place. That's not what I have for you to do. But both situations are very true. One, we're, we're not doing anything to cause it. And then there's another one where we're purposefully sometimes putting ourselves in a place that we know can lead to difficulties. And it's been said, you know, people ask, why God, why do good things or why do bad things happen to good people? And we know this, bad things happen to all of us in this world, regardless of where we are, regardless of our walk with the Lord or if we don't have a walk with the Lord, right? If you guys have your Bibles or if you're using your electronic device, you can go to Ephesians chapter two and we're gonna be looking at verses one through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And anytime, anytime I read my Bible, anytime I read my word, what I like to do, because let's be honest, and I'm sure this is the case for maybe a lot of you in here, sometimes you read your Bible, you, you don't really know the background of why this book was written, you just read it and you're like, 
okay, God, what did you mean by that? I have no clue what you're talking about. And then you just kind of go on throughout your day and you're, you're still wondering and then it gets a little bit hard. So you stop praying about it or you stop rereading that text and you just kind of put it away and get, I guess I just don't understand my word. I guess I just don't understand God's word. So I'm just gonna listen to a podcast. I'll listen to the preacher at church, which is important to do, right? But we won't get into our word ourselves, right? It's so important for you to get into your word. And I want to encourage you, if you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, which I know you do, which is why you're here tonight, get into your word. Spend time with him alone in the word. Yeah, you might not understand it right away. That's a part of a relationship. You, don't, you might not understand exactly what the person in the relationship that you're in, what they're saying at that moment, but the more you get to hang out with them, the more you get to know them, you see what makes them tick. You start to understand what they're saying. You start to get to know their heart. And the same is true when we are in our word. You might not understand exactly what God is saying right there, but keep praying, keep asking, keep reading, keep meditating on that portion of scripture. And I guarantee you that he will reveal himself to you through it. And when that happens, your relationship gets strengthened. Your confidence in God gets strengthened. The other way, it's kind of like if you're dating, a, a, if you're a guy dating a girl or a girl dating a guy and you're like, you know what? I really want to date this person. But you ask your best friend and said, you know what? Can you do me a favor? Can you go on this date for me? Can you find out all about them? Can you find out what they like, what they dislike? Find out what makes them tick? Find out their laugh. Is it a good laugh? Is it not a good laugh? And then come back and report all that to me and let me know, right? That's kind of how sometimes we act with our relationship with God. It's like, I, I, I'd rather see the relationship that this pastor has with God. I'd rather find out what, what this pastor heard from God instead of me sitting down and getting alone with him. So I want to encourage you, read your word. Find out about the text that you're reading so you can place yourself in it. So as we go into Ephesians, what I want you to know is that the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians, the epistle of Ephesians, whatever verbiage you want to use, is considered one of the four captivity letters to the church. Paul wrote these letters in prison. He was in prison in Rome. The other three books are Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, which is a fun word to say, Philemon, okay? These letters were written to churches as encouragement some of them correction, while he was in prison. Isn't that crazy? He's trying to encourage others while he's going through difficulty. Now, Paul went to Ephesus on his second missionary journey, and he loved the church there in Ephesus. He had to end up leaving. He went back on his third missionary journey, ended up spending a total of about three years there. And while he's in prison, he decides, you know what, I need to write to this Gentile church, Gentile church, non-Jewish church. That's you and me, okay? And what you're gonna find out as we get into this text of how appropriate it is for you and me here today. It is so relevant to you and me here today. And if you're a note taker, we're gonna break these uh, sections up after we read the text. And our first section is our past position. That's chapters or verses one through three, our past position. The second is our progression in position. That's verses four through seven. And then our provided position, verses eight through 10. And now here's what I want you to get when I say the word position. You guys ever heard in a movie, hopefully you've never had it said to you, it's normally meant in a derogatory term, but somebody says, you know what, know your place. Know your place. If you've ever had that said to you, I'm sorry, it's hurtful. But in this context, it's a good thing. And I want you as a believer to know your place. And I want you to hear this in the scripture that we are going to be hearing this evening. But before we get into our word, it's so important that we pray, that we all just close our eyes. Father, we come before you, expect it to hear your word. Expect it to hear you speak to us through your word. And so, Father, I pray for all of us in here right now, for those online, that our hearts would be open, that we would hear your heart through the Apostle Paul speaking to the church today, that we would know our position in you, God, 
how you see us, what you've called us to do. May we see that through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So once, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. His spirit, his spirit is at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. But all of us, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God, but God is so merciful, so filled with mercy, that even though we were dead, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead alongside Christ and has sat us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Amen? Amen. Verse 7 continues to say, So God can point out to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for those who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a, a reward for good things we have done, so no one can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things he planned for us long ago. Now, I don't know about you, but that section of Ephesians is one of my favorite. Ephesians is one of my favorite books. And this section of scripture is so, so powerful. So let's look at what our past position was. For those of us who are believers, our past position wasn't wasn't too good, right? We were dead. Our past position before Christ was death, spiritually dead. Why? Because of our sins. I love how scripture puts it. It says because of your disobedience and not just like a couple of your small little sins, but your many sins. We lived in a habitual lifestyle of sin. And then here's a part that's crazy. It says, when you lived that way, who, I mean, when, when we lived that way, who did we follow? What does scripture say? Who we were following? It said the devil. Now, I don't know about you, but doesn't that sound kind of uncomfortable? Like, yeah, I, I wasn't following the devil. I didn't have a bumper sticker on the back of my car that said the devil is my co-pilot, right? I didn't have that. What are you talking about that I followed the devil, that I, I, I followed him? What the heck does that mean? I'm just doing me, man. I'm not following no devil. I'm just doing me. The doing me mentality is a spirit of rebellion. The doing me mentality is a spirit of rebellion. And that spirit, that spirit is at work in the lives of those who refuse to obey God. And because of that, you and I, we were subject to God's anger. Now get this, our progression in position. But God, I, I love those two words. But God. I don't know what you guys are going through here today. Some of you I'm sure are going through extremely difficult times, fearful times, scary things, things that you don't even want to ask for prayer on because you're embarrassed about it. You don't want people to look at you differently. Take your very real situation that you're in, the very real pain that you're feeling. Never want to diminish that. The very real circumstances that you're in and add in but God. Because see, we were dead, but God is so rich in mercy that though we were dead, gave us life. 
We moved from death and started to move into life. And it was at a high cost. It cost Jesus' death on the cross for your sins and my sins going on to him. And it would cause him to die and then for you and I to raise again. And here's the thing. We are seated with him. That's kind of weird verbiage. I'm like, we're, we're in the MPV at Water of Life. But our position is now in Christ. We are no longer dead, for those of us who are in Christ. We are alive, amen? So we have a place of what? Victory. You are coming from a place of victory, not failure. You are coming from a place of victory. Here's the problem. Too often we forget that because of our very real circumstances. The devil who is out there seeking whom he can devour, he knows he lost, but he knows too often that we don't realize that. And so he wants to use circumstances to draw us away from God. But we come from a position of power. Now, I, I want you to do something with me. This might sound a little silly, but eh, amuse me. I'm up here. I have the microphone. Turn to your neighbor and just say, I come from a position of power. Now, I want you to, I want you to look at your neighbor again and say it as you mean it. Say it as you mean it inside, and especially for those of you, you know inside, you don't have to share it with anybody, that you're coming from a difficult position to say, I come from a position of power. All right, thank you for amusing me. I appreciate that. Now here's point number three. Here's point number three, our provided position. Now, I don't know about you, but I think one of the things that kind of stinks sometimes is like if you're working in a group and you come up with an idea and that idea works, then somebody else takes credit for it. Doesn't that kind of stink? Anybody have that happen before? And you're like, dude, like, what do I say now? I, am I the guy that is like, hey, that was my idea? Or do I just let it go, you know? It's like, that's weird, right? But I know inside, I'm like, it's my idea, God. You know that, right? I want everybody else to know too. But... That happens a lot. Sometimes we as believers want to think that our salvation came out of our own hands. Sometimes we want to believe, you know what, I was just so good because I was able to stop doing those things I once did and now of course God wants me sitting next to Jesus, right? Because I'm so amazing. I'm so awesome. No, you're not. You stink just like everyone else and me but it's only by the grace of God. He did it all. We can't boast about it. He loved you so much. He chose you. You have been chosen. And I tell this to my fifth and sixth grade students sometimes. I think schools still do this, and I didn't like it at all. But who, ha who else with me has been a little bit scarred from their school years when they would say, hey, okay, we're gonna pick you and you to be the team captain. Now you have to pick the other kids to be on your team. And I remember when that would happen, I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to be last. I know it. My wife just laughed. That was awesome. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be last. So I sit there and I'm trying not to, I'm going to be honest, like, I'm not going to lie. I'm trying not to get teary-eyed. And I'm like, man, this is going to happen again. I'm going to be last. Oh, okay, cool. I'm last. Awesome. I knew it. You know? And then the guy's always like, oh, I guess I'll take Jesus. Right? And so I go over. I mean, that's a painful thing. Not being chosen, that's painful. And I think many of us in here have experienced those moments in life where we don't feel chosen. But see, here's the thing. God, the creator of the universe, has chosen each of you. He has chosen each and every single one of you. And so those moments in life that come where you feel like people have turned away from you, they've shunned you, they've said, no, you're weird, you're crazy, you, you hurt yourself by pulling an ice chest, they don't want to be around you, right? You can say, no, but God has chosen me, and I'm going to rest on that. Our position comes from God. We can't take credit for it. I want to show you guys a picture. I'm curious to see... If this looks familiar to you at all, if we can throw up that first picture on the screen. Does that look familiar to anybody? Anybody know what that is? It's 
Michelangelo's uh, masterpiece painted atop the Sistine Chapel in Rome. I've, I've never gone to see it, and I've only seen it in pictures and movies. But this is a famous part of that painting. The next picture shows the picture in totality. You either see it in that or that form, right? But I, I, I'm, I'm sure that for the majority of you in here, that those are probably the only two pictures you've ever seen from the Sistine Chapel. That picture is actually the most replicated in history, that scene. For print, for movies, for books, whatever it is, that is the most replicated painting in history. And we can show the other two pictures. This is, I mean, I, I couldn't get enough pictures. I didn't want to spend the whole time showing you guys pictures of the Sistine Chapel, but this is other sections of it. It's a massive, massive fresco. It's a massive, massive painting. But most people are only familiar with those two other pictures that we just looked at. And what those paintings show, what that painting shows, it's a part of Michelangelo. It shows us some of his traits. It shows us his imagination, his patience, attention to detail, and the ability of the artist to create something from nothing. I want you to hear something. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Now, I want you to think of something. Have you ever considered yourself to be a masterpiece? And maybe some of you in here are like, I say that to myself every time I look in the mirror in the morning, <laughs> right? Okay. But I want you to realize that you are a masterpiece of God. Now, in a very real way, what that scripture is saying, that all of us as the church paint the picture of the masterpiece of God. All of us here. But yeah, our worship team, can you guys, you can start making your way up if you don't mind. But I am sure that there are people that we come into contact with each and every single day who obviously don't come to church. They only see one part of that masterpiece. And that's you and me. And when they see us, when they see us, does does how we carry ourselves, how we, how we love God, does that emanate from us? Does it cause them, when they see us, to look up, to see the works of our Heavenly Father? And when they see us, do they ex see a reflection of Himself? Do they see His traits in us? Do they see His imagination, His patience, His attention to detail, His love, His compassion, His grace, when they see us? Now, that kind of living only comes when we realize our position. That kind of living only comes when you and I, as sons and daughters of the Most High God, realize our position in Him. And I, I love the fact that Paul takes us on that journey to say, hey, look, this is where you were. This is where you are now. And I don't know about you, but I want to function in the where I am now, not where the I once was. Because where I once was was good for nothing. Where I once was hurt people. Where I once was only thought of myself and wanted to put myself ahead of others. Where I was before, I was dead. And now I have life. So I ask you a question in here. Will we allow, will we allow the enemy to have any kind of victory in our lives here today? Will we allow the enemy to use tough circumstances, the pain that we go through in life to draw us away from God? Or will we allow those moments to draw us closer to our Father? 
And I want to encourage you guys here tonight. You know what? Do me a favor. Just close your eyes. Nobody looking. And I want you to be honest with, with yourself. And if you're in here right now and you would say, you know what? All too often, all too often I forget my position. I forget that I come from a place in victory. I allow fear. I allow anxiety to overtake me. If that's you in here right now with your eyes closed, would you just raise your hand? this place right now and you would say you know what I I know I come from a place of victory I know where God's brought in me but all too often I I want to toe the line all too often I want to be like okay God how how much of my old self can I kind of bring in and still come from a place of victory if that's you and you've been towing the line, would you be brave enough with everyone's eyes closed just to raise your hands? You can put your hands down. You can open your eyes. Here's what I want us to do. I want to encourage you right now, if you raised your hands to either one of those, things that I just brought up. In just a moment, we're going to go back into worship. And I want to encourage, especially those of you who raise your hands, I want all of you to do this if if you're so inclined to do it. To stand and to make your way forward in just a moment as we go into worship. Because here's the thing, guys. We live in a world today that needs believers to believe. And what I mean by that is if you and I were in a movie theater and I yelled out, fire, if you believed me, you would get up and leave. Now, if you just stayed there because you don't want to let go of your $10 popcorn, I understand that. But you're like, I I believe you. I will go. Right? If I go up to you and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Like, the place is on fire. Let's go. You're like, no, I believe you, but I'm just going to chill here for a bit. Okay, you you don't believe me right? That's what we do as believers sometimes. I believe God, but I'm not, I'm not going to seek after him. That's contradictory, right? And I want to encourage you here today. If you believe God, if you believe that you have victory, if you believe you came from death and you are now positioned in life, that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realm because you are united with our Lord Jesus Christ. If that is you in this place today and you want to determine in your heart, you know what, God, I'm not going to live lackadaisical in my relationship with you anymore. I'm going to be on fire for you, God. I'm going to live out of victory, God. I'm not going to allow the circumstances in my life to dictate my life anymore. Paul was in prison when he wrote this. If I was in prison, I'd be probably crying. But he was in prison and he had the power of Christ inside of him and was still worried about encouraging other believers. So if you want to stand and declare here tonight that you have victory, do me a favor right now and just stand up. If that's you in here and you're saying, you know what? I know I have victory in Christ. I want to live in victory. No longer worried about my current circumstances. I'm not going to let them dictate my life anymore. I'm not going to give the enemy any victory. Then I'm going to ask someone to come up here just for a second. If you can move the the chair and table for me, if you don't mind. Because... My wife's going to yell at me for doing this right now, but that's okay. Do me a favor. 
Make your way forward as we go into worship. Come on forward. And here's where I want your heart and your mind to be. Here's where I want your heart and your mind to be right now. You have victory. You have victory. You have been chosen. The God of the universe who created heaven and earth, who makes beautiful things out of nothing, who raises the dead, has chosen each and every single one of you. And as a response in our life, may that belief, may that love flow each and every single day. And as we go into worship right now, would we have that mindset of, God, you are amazing, you are good, thank you, God. And let's just, like that song says, not the one we're singing right now, but let's just recklessly worship our God. Can we do that? Let's worship. And our Father,
Father, we come before you. Oh, God, what an awesome thing it is to hear your people praising you, God. Lord, I thank you for each and every single person that is here and those online, God. Lord, I pray that you would move in the hearts of your people. Lord, that when they leave here today, that that they would know, God, that you love them, that you care for them, that you have a plan and a purpose for each and every single one of them, God. That they would know that they live in victory, not in fear, but in victory, God. Because of you, Lord Jesus, who we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Hey, man, can we give it up for Jesus one more time? So good, so good. Well, hey, um, man, tonight's not over. It's not just getting started, but it's not over. Um, if you're new here, one thing we like to do, we, we've said from the beginning of the year, is that um, it's more than just about a speaker, or more than just, but, it's, but we're about learning from one another, having conversations with one another, growing from one another, that there's things that you may have heard in, heard in the message that God may have been speaking to you, that when you share to the next person can help them deal with some things that they may be going through or maybe seeing things in a different perspective. So at this time, um, we're actually gonna go into our tables. So this is what I wanna encourage you um, to do is in the back, our table leaders are already there. Go ahead and make your way to the tables. I think Britt's gonna be bringing out those Otter Pops that I promised you guys earlier, but this is a great space, man, for, for you. Like I said, there's no pressure. There's no, you don't have to come and speak super deep, but just from a real place of maybe the, I have been in this place where my past has gotten to the place or gotten in the way of living life the, from the position that God has called me to. And this is a great place to have this conversation. So I encourage you to head to the back. Leaders are already in the back. Um, and we'll come close in a few minutes. <laughs>